Welcome everyone as you are trickling in. Um, we are so happy to have you with us tonight. Um, I see some familiar movie myth busting names in the attendees list and I see some new ones also so that's great. Uh, while we are waiting for everyone to sort of trickle in, um, if you guys could just introduce yourself in the chat um, and we will get started shortly. Hey, Victor. Oh my goodness, Sam Asher here joining us. No pressure or anything. <laughs> Lori, so good to see you. All right. Maureen just saw Defiance two days ago. So if you have any fresh questions, uh, feel free to <laughs> drop them in the chat. I also just rewatched this a couple of days ago, just so I remembered. Perfect. Martha and Chris, movie myth busting regulars. <laughs> well, it is so good to see everyone. Since we are um, a few minutes after seven, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I, my time here is brief. I am just here to say welcome back to uh, this edition of Movie Myth Busting. Um, we are so happy to have this exhibit, Violins of Hope, um, at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, as well as the Virginia Holocaust Museum and the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia. Um, and so we do have all of our partners on the line, Trinity, Megan, and Ashi, representatives of all of these institutions. So if anyone out there in the audience has any questions um, for you know, any of our respective institutions, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, but my time with you guys is over now. I am gonna turn it over um, to Megan and Avshi. Megan is the Director of Education at the Virginia Holocaust Museum. So she'll be giving us a little bit of context. Um, and Avshi is related to the family that this film follows and, and dramatizes in Hollywood tradition. Um, so he'll tell us a little bit about uh, watching his family's history get turned into a movie. Um, so. All that being said, I am going off camera. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and I am turning it over to you guys. Have a good one. All right, thanks, Maggie. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Megan Ferenzi and I'm the Director of Education at the Virginia Holocaust Museum. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for tuning in this evening as we take a look at the 2008 film Defiance, which many of you have said you've been watching over the past couple of days. It's uh, currently on Netflix. Uh, joining us for our conversation tonight, and it's currently 2 a.m. <laughs> where he is, is Avshi Weinstein. Um, Avshi is a third generation Israeli violin maker, and along with making violins, Avshi and his father Amnon have spent the last two decades working to locate and restore violins that were played by Jewish musicians during the Holocaust. He and his father have put back violins so that they could be brought to life again on the concert stage. And although most of the musicians who originally played these instruments were silenced by the Holocaust, their voices and spirits live on through the violins that they have so lovingly restored. They call these violins of hope. Currently, violins of hope are on display at the Virginia Holocaust Museum, the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, and the Black History and Cultural Center of Virginia. Near the end of um, this evening's program, we will be sharing more about this powerful and inspiring exhibit. So this evening, our focus is on Avshi's connection um, to the history of the Holocaust as a third generation survivor and the grandson of Azile Belsky, whose experience along with his brothers as Jewish partisans during the Holocaust is the basis for the film Defiance. Before we get into our discussion of the movie tonight, though, I want to share with you some background regarding partisans during the Holocaust, which will help you place the events of the film within the larger historical narrative. All right. What is a partisan? And you can see on the screen um, the Belsky partisans. 
So a partisan is a member of an organized body of fighters who attack or harass an enemy, especially within an occupied territory. So that's official definition. Um, the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation, which I recommend you checking out um, after this evening's program, it's a great resource. Um, it explains that during World War II, the majority of European Jews were deceived by the Nazi disinformation campaign. The Nazis and their collaborators isolated and imprisoned, imprisoned Jews in ghettos. Millions were deported into concentration camps or were sent to killing centers, primarily by convincing them that they were being sent to labor camps instead. In reality, most Jews who entered these so-called work camps starved, murdered, or worked to death. Yet approximately 30,000 Jews escaped the Nazis to form or join resistance groups like the Bielski partisans. These Jews are known as Jewish partisans. All right, so who were the Bielski partisans, which the movie Defiance is focused on? Um, the Nazis arrived in the Bielski small town in eastern Poland, which is now Belarus, in 1941, parents and two of their siblings, Tuvia, Zeus, Azael Belsky and the youngest brother, Aaron, escaped to a nearby forest. Initially, they were just looking to save their own lives um, and their family members' lives. However, the familiarity with the forest helped them elude the Nazis and their collaborators. And over time, more Jews joined their partisan group. And the main mission of the group um, became to save as many lives as possible looking to protect all Jews, regardless of their age or gender. The Bielskis never turned anyone away, creating a community in the forest. They had established workshops with blacksmiths and carpenters, a bakery, a school, an infirmary, and even a courthouse and jail. When the Bielski partisans were liberated in June of 1944, there were over 1,200 people in their group. More than 70% were women, elderly and children who otherwise may have perished, perished under the Nazi occupation. This was very rare, a number like 70% of women, elderly and children. Um, as many partisans only wanted people that were physically able to fight the Nazis. So the movie Defiance um, in 2008, the Bielski partisan story was brought to the big screen in the movie Defiance. It's based on a book called Defiance, the Bielski Partisans. The film is based on actual events and it opens, we see the 2008 film open in 1941 with the Nazi Einsatzgruppen moving through Poland systematic Jews. The Bielski brothers, Tuvia played by Daniel Craig, Zeus played by Leah Schreiber, and Azile, Bell, and Aaron are among the Jews that are still living. Their parents have been killed by the local police. After the death of their parents, the brothers flee to a nearby forest and vow to avenge their deaths. While their brothers are in the forest, they encounter other Jews that have escaped death and they take them under their protection. Over the next few years, they take in and provide shelter, for a growing number of Jewish refugees. Casualties caused Tuvia to reconsider this approach because of the risk to hiding Jews. So then there's a rivalry, which we see in the film between the two older brothers, Tuvia and Zeus. And they have this disagreement about the future of the group. Zeus decides to leave the partisan group and join a local company of Soviet partisans while his older brother Tuvia remains as their camp leader. We see in the film that after a winter of sickness, starvation, and attempted mutiny and constant hiding, the camp learns that Germans are about to attack them by force. A delaying force stays behind, led by Azael. The defense goes, the defense does not last long. Only Azael and another camp member survive, and they're able to rejoin the rest of the group who are at the edge. Of the group is then attacked by a German platoon, and just as all seems lost, the Germans are assaulted from the rear by a partisan force led by Zeus, who has deserted the Soviets to, to rejoin um, the Bielski partisans. As the survivors escape into the forest, the film ends as text on the screen states that they lived in the 
for two years. They built a hospital, a nursery, a school. And as I said earlier, they had by the end of the war, over 1,200 people that they had saved. Original photographs near the end of the film of the Belsky partisans are shown. And we learned that after the Holocaust, Tuvia and Zeus, they immigrated to Palestine and then came to the United States. Their younger brother, Aaron, joined them in the US. And Azael, who is the grandfather of Avshi, who we'll talk with tonight, he was drafted by the Soviet army. And unfortunately, he died six months later in 1945. So let's introduce Avshi into this conversation. Um, Avshi is the grandson, as I said earlier, of Azael Bielski. Hey, Avshi, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you, and I hope uh, you all a little bit more um, up than me, but uh, I'll do my best. We really so, appreciate you. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, it's pretty rare that you get to talk with someone that has a movie based on their family members' lives, and on top of that, this is an incredible story of rescue. Personally, I can remember seeing this movie when it was released in 2008. So I have a ton of questions for you, as I'm sure our audience does as well. And we'll get to those near the end of this evening's program. Oh. First for you is at what age did you know about your family's history, specifically about the Belsky partisans? Honestly, I can't really answer that question because whenever we would go to my uh, grandmother from my mother's side to Chaya, um, the bedtime stories were partisan stories. So I would guess probably four or five years old, um, but I don't remember the first time, the first day. But this is where we used to lay down in her bed, me on one of her sides, my sister from the other side, and the bedtime, bedtime stories were partisan stories. I don't know if we asked them for them. Honestly, I can't remember, um, but... Um, these were bedtime stories. So I do know it from a very, very young age. So the grandma that told you this story, she's actually in the film, right? Hi. Yes. She's in the film. So she becomes the forest wife of Azile no. in the film. No, no that, we'll... that's that's wrong. <laughs> that's incorrect. We'll dig into that deeper then. But she was um she was portrayed in the movie uh, yes. as well. So what's it like to have your family's story made into a Hollywood movie? Well, it's very nice. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's not something that everyone can say, oh, you know, have you seen this movie? This is my family. Right. But it is a quite an incredible story, if you think about it. Um, in the area they live, they were basically one of the only Jewish families as well as my grandmother's family. The area in general, they were not so much uh, Jewish friendly. And as you can all imagine during the war, um, being Jewish outside the ghetto meant they can, they can literally kill you on the spot and still get paid for your body or get paid for uh, bringing you into the Nazi police. So it's not, it's not an easy thing. First of all, you're talking about a place which the winter is, uh, let's say a bit harsher than Richmond. It gets extremely cold for many months. You have the snow and everything. You can't really heat yourself properly because if you start making big fires, the smoke will show the Nazis where you are. And the Nazis were hunting partisans all the time, not only once every few months. Um, they had huge prices on their heads, the three brothers, the whole war. Um, and this was, it was a challenge also to feed more and more and more people in a place who doesn't want to give you food. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite an endeavor. Right, and it, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's such an um, amazing story, right? And, um, but was there any apprehension in having this story told through film at all? Um, I don't know what your, your mother thought about this. Um, did they ever like have to ask her permission to use this story? Or did they interview her at all? So they did ask. I think my mother had to sign a paper um, when they started working on the movie. Um, they didn't. She, my mother, went with uh, my aunt with her sister to the filming site, 
And um, they met also with Edward Zwick, the, um, he was a the director. Yeah. He was the director of yeah. the movie. And um, he told my mother, he said, listen, this is not a documentary and it's not meant to be a documentary. Um, it is based on true story, of course. But he said that in the end, about 150 million people worldwide will see the movie. And then if they want to go and learn and hear more things about the Bieski brothers, they can go and read the books and which are, let's say, much more as a, basically done as a history books. Um, there are quite few books which were published. So in the end, it's Hollywood, but most of the things you see, you see in the movie, they actually happen, maybe not exactly as they shown in the movie. So that's a perfect segue into my next uh, couple of questions, actually. Let's start focusing um, on the movie. And, you know, you had said that that um, the director of the film, Edward Zwick, he had said, you know, this isn't a documentary, um, you know, so there are things within the film that are history, right? They're historically accurate. And there are some things that are more Hollywood. Um, so Ashi, one of the subplots of the film is this relationship between your grandfather, Azael, and your grandmother, Haya. It shows that they first met in the forest. Is that the story of actually how they met? Um, no. the, there's a scene where he first like lays eyes on her. And I think it's Tuvia, um, Daniel Craig kind of like pushes him to like go talk to her um, and he alcohol to like kind of give him some liquid courage well to do that I guess is that how they actually met no it's not um not. can you share with us my, how they yeah. did so my grandfather's family there were 11 brothers and, and sisters and my grandmother's family there were also 11 brothers and sisters and because they lived in the nearby villages they knew each other before the war some of my uncles and aunts from both families already got married before the war and the lucky ones actually moved to the United States before, and the rest stayed. And um, my grandmother, she was the youngest. And um, although my grandfather was in love with her a long time before the war, she didn't want to marry a village boy, let's say, an uneducated uh, person, but they made a deal. Um, and this is something you don't see in the movie. They made a deal, and the deal was basically that uh, if my grandfather saves my grandmother with her parents, she will marry him. And he did. You don't see my grand-grandparents in the movie uh, from my mother's side, but uh, they lived. They survived the forest um, with the help of my grandfather and my grandmother, of course. And this was uh, the condition of um, getting married. So they did know each other from before the war. Um, I don't know if the wedding was actually like that in the forest, I don't know, I don't think it really, really matters, but um, the wedding gift my grandfather gave my grandmother was a, a pistol, a handgun, which was uh, a very precious thing in the forest. Having your own weapon was a luxury. Most of the people couldn't get weapon uh, because there was simply never enough weapon, ammunition or anything. He made my grandmother swear to him that she will always keep the last bullet to herself because when the Nazis caught partisans, they would, go, they would basically die in torture to try and uh, get the location of the camp. So because my grandmother and everybody else, they had to go and work for the camp, going around, taking food and stuff. They were all the time in danger of being caught by the Nazis, so they always this was something which you had in your mind. If you're getting caught, you'll be tortured. And few people were got, did get caught and were tortured. And all their the bodies would be hanged up, you know, in the, literally hanged up in the streets, mutilated for people to see and, and fear and um, maybe give some, um, give some information about the camp if they knew. So it sounds like um, the forest was obviously a like very dangerous place to live. Um, and it's just amazing that they were able to survive and her, you know, her parents um, as well. Um, do you know, so there are, you know, this concept of husband forest and or husband wives 
um, or forest husbands and wives, I'll get it correct, um, is mentioned several times throughout the movie, this concept. Is that something that you know that was actually you? Um, like that, that vocabulary? Well, is it something that was created for the film? This we didn't hear on my, uh, in my mother, in my grandmother's bed, uh, forest wife, yeah, but um, my uncle um, Tuvia, he got married to Lilka and they stayed together for all their lives. Also Zeus. Uh, Aon, of course, was a bit too young to get married. Um, but uh, unfortunately, yes, my grandfather, he died in the war, so we weren't married for too long. And um, I mean, people got together because this was in a way, because men were in a fighting for, uh, force, they would get maybe a little bit more benefits. So you wanted to have someone with benefits so you can eat better. So I, I would guess that's a, that would be something bright. So you spoke about, um, you know, your grandfather giving your grandmother a gun and you, he had, you know, said to her, keep, you know, you need to promise to keep the last bullet for yourself. So in case she's captured, um, you know, she wouldn't be like tortured at all. Um, so in the movie, um, you know, there are several different fighting scenes between the Nazis and sometimes between local collaborators. Um, you know, sometimes it's happening in the forest and also the village. And the scene that I'm specifically thinking of is the one where after learning that his son and wife were killed, um, Zeus goes into the town with some people from the camp and he wants to avenge his, um, it sounds like his son and his wife's deaths. Um, and during that scene, the Nazis show up and there's some gunfire and a sile ends up getting pushed by the gunfire, like away from the rest of the group. And they don't know where he is for some time. And, um, you know, they're very like angry and they talk about how, you know, he's probably being tortured as we speak by the Nazis. Um, is that something that happened in real life at all? Um, I mean, eventually he does make his way back, but is that something that you know that happened? Not to my knowledge, but um, the other scene that you see Tuvia um, going into the village and killing a family, that happened. Uh, there were collaborators, every single place. I mean, Jews who would escape the ghetto would, would try to stay out of the ghetto if they were caught by the locals, like they said, they had a prize on their head, literally dead or alive. Uh, they would be killed by the locals for a pair of boots or a weapon if they had or for just being Jews and getting the price of giving them to the locals. And um, they killed one, the whole family and burned the house uh, of one of the collaborators. And after that, it simply stopped. And the only place all over Europe, I mean, literally all over Europe, that Jewish people could try, I mean, of course, try to escape a ghetto and be safe but while doing it was that area because people were literally afraid that if they do something, the Bielski brothers will come and they will kill them. And in 90, I think it was 1993, um, a big part of my family, they went back. Um, some of my cousins and uncles, people who were alive, my grandmother as well, um, they went back to the forest, to the, that area, and there is a film made, I mean, of course, the, um, it's not a great, uh, as you can imagine, it's 93. It's not a 8K, whatever, blah, 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 <laughs> high definition. But you see that when they get to the area where this house was, they start whispering. You remember what we've done here, blah, blah, blah. And the locals, they still remember them. When they came there, many people said, ah, you are Bielskis, right? And they still remember them 50 years later. Yeah, so I mean, they had a they had a pretty well known reputation over time, and I yes. think where you see like more people kind of coming into the forest, right um, near the end. People, yes, people heard, and people. they and they tried getting people out, also to try and help them. Um, listen, there was no communication. Nobody knew what's going on around here. They knew what happens in their area. They could probably guess this is the same thing all around Europe. Um, they probably knew by then that uh, Hitler took all Western Europe because uh, their war started in 
June 1941. It's uh, well after um, uh, France and all the West was taken. So they could only guess. I mean, there was no radios that you could sit in the evening and listen and mark your map. Okay, th these ones are here, that ones are there. They probably, li they lived in a way of thinking that they are, they are the last Jewish people living on earth because this is give or take what they knew. They knew other partisans groups around. There was another um, family camp, smaller one, not too far away. Uh, but this was basically it. Maybe a few Jewish partisans here and there in the, um, in the Russian or Polish uh, partisans. But basically, I mean, these were the only one who they, they thought that are still alive and might survive the war if they are lucky. Right. And I mean, throughout the film, we see the struggle of trying to balance you know, saving people's lives, but also in creating community amongst partisans, um, but also trying to be tough, right? And with who is let in um, and, you know, whether or not they need to do like more like physical fighting back against the Nazis and their collaborators. Do you think that this is a struggle, something, I mean, because you see this in the film play out through the relationship between Tuvia and Zeus, right? Um, you know, the struggle between like, you know, one person wanting to bring people in and um, create a sense of community. And then Zeus actually ends up leaving because he thinks they need to do like more fighting. Is that something that actually happened or? Um, yes. What happened? Um, I can't really tell you if there was a fight, a real fight between them about bringing more people or not, but um, any person you bring in, you need to feed. They were literally hungry for three years. They never had enough. Nobody actually really, really fed them because the food they took, again, they had to take from the locals, not Jewish. Many of them were probably anti-Semitic, not much less than the Nazis, but they were simply afraid. Either from the retaliation of the group or because they knew that they are in a way under the protection of the Russian partisans a bit later when all the partisan movements started to be settled down and much more, um, let's say, organized. Uh, there were command, different commands. They had uh, contact with Moscow or uh, let's say with the Russian army. They would get uh, orders. There was even a, an airport in one of the forests. This you're talking about huge, huge, huge places that the Nazis couldn't go in and, and take every single million, uh, centimeter, yeah? So they had kind of a communication going back and forth and because they were part of the Russian partisan movement, the locals had to help them, otherwise they will suffer from the Bielskis and from the Russians. But let's say that they had, they had to make sure that everybody knows that they are a force and if someone tried to do something, they will get their revenge. Very simple. So this was uh, this was the way. I mean, um, every person who came in and you had to feed, you had, it meant more people going on food mission, taking the risk of being caught, taking the risk of telling where the camp is, and basically maybe putting everybody in danger. On one hand, um, did Zeus live to the Russian unit? Yes, he did with my grandfather and group of warriors, of people who could fight. This was uh, basically an order from uh, Russian partisan command. Uh, later on, my grandfather basically deserted. He went back to the group uh, because he wanted to be next to my grandmother and try and save her and help her and support her and the camp. Um, this basically meant a death sentence for my grandfather for desertion. There was not uh, Let's say the forest rules were a little bit different and a bit more harsh and there wouldn't be judge and jury, it was simply a shot in the back of the head and that's it. But they managed to commute his sentence and he stayed in the group. They did go out and fight. Uh, mainly they would uh, uh, take down trains, blow the railway up and then take whatever they can and run away back to the forest. Uh, small things, I and mean, they couldn't fight a big force. They never had enough ammunition, they never had enough men. And this was, uh, listen, fighting a regular German army is 
not something which, which was uh, an easy thing. Right. I mean, it's a it's a small group of people that have you know fled into the forest and they're supposed to fight against an entire like country or regime, right? I mean, it's um, it can be impossible to do. Um, you know, I'm thinking of this scene in the movie, like along the lines of, you know, who to let in and how many people. There's a specific scene um, where they, uh, they go into a ghetto um, and they're it kind of, they're talking with, um, it's uh, Tuvia and then your, your grandfather. Um, and they go in um, and they're talking with like in a room kind of in secret with a bunch of people from the ghetto trying to convince them to come with them. Um, and, and, you know, they talk about how like, we, you know, we know your husband, you know, he's in the group or your daughter, right? She's in our group, you should come with us. Um, and they end up, some people end up coming with them um, and, and they bring them into the forest. Do you know, is this something that happened as well? Um, or is as, it they would? as far as I know, they, they themselves did not go to the ghettos, but they did send messengers to try and bring out. One of the things were, was most of the Jewish people in those areas, they lived in cities and for them to go and live in the forest was, let's say, a weekend thing rather than a, a life way. Um, and don't forget there were punishments. If someone would run away from the ghetto, the Nazis would kill for everyone, whatever, five, 10 people. So it's either you take everybody or you don't take anyone. And the repercussions were very high. And people didn't believe, I mean, come on. It's, uh, how can you live in the forest? They, they knew who the, the real neighbors were. And uh, they knew what is a uh, winter in Belarus. And living in the forest, this was, it was very tough. Yeah, and you know, when we talk about the Holocaust and I often talk about this um, with groups that come to the museum, it's that, you know, we have the benefit of hindsight, right? Of, you know, when we study history and we look back, right? And I think when you're thinking about like how people are getting information, right? Back at that time and the information that they were receiving, it was kind of like in bits and pieces. And, you know, they had, and they, they talk about it in the film, they had heard about the camps, um, but, you know, there were people that, you know, didn't believe it, um, you know, what was happening. And, um, you know, it was this, it was under this guise that I actually spoke about earlier in the program where, you know, things were kind of done under this guise of, oh, you're just going to go work in a, in a labor camp. So, I mean, you know, it was in the film when they show them coming to them, you know, people are trying to weigh like, do we risk leaving, you know, leave and, and go into the forest and, um, you know, try and survive the winter or have someone come and find us. Um, you know, th those are really tough um, decisions to make. And um, I mean, it's amazing that, you know, 70% of people in their group were women, children, elderly. Um, can you give some thoughts or insight into why, you know, maybe, maybe your grandma had mentioned it, like, why, you know, why did they decide to do that? Um, you know, when they could have maybe kept their group smaller and with people that were physically able to fight back if they did come under attack, um, you know, can you give any, any insight into that or maybe even why they were so successful? Um, because it is considered to be one of the most successful partisan um, groups um, with so many lives saved. Um, honestly, I don't know, but they took the decision understanding and knowing that if they won't do it, probably nobody else. The Russians would not save Jewish elderly. The Russians wouldn't save Jewish kids. The Poland, the, then it was still Poland, yes, yeah? so the Polish partisans as well. So if they won't do it, nobody else will. If they would tell someone they can't come into the group, they basically condemn him to death. His or her chance living in the wood or survive, let's say surviving the war outside the camp, running away from a ghetto, it's something which is very close to zero. Um, so they did it because they thought this is the, the way it should be and trying to help 
anyone they can. Listen, in the end, it was it was meant to be family, but you know, yeah, you know, I know this guy, I know this friend, I have this one, I have this. I mean, you can't say no. I'll, I'll give you an example. When the movie came out in 2008, um, my mother hired a small hall in uh, outside Tel Aviv and they showed the movie and I called some of my friends and everything. And, um, in those time I lived, I lived in the Tel Aviv Marina and I, I had quite a few friends from the Marina coming and seeing the movie and every day we would meet them and saying hi, hi. You know, here. A friend of mine who saw the movie said, you know, for a month or so, every day we met, he said, you know, it's a great movie, it's a great movie, it's a great movie. And one day he says, you know, my sister, she went to New York to close our grandmother's house and she found out that his, they found out that his mother and his grandmother were part of the Bielski partisans. They simply had no idea. Wow. And I tell you honestly, he is not my family member, yeah? We have nothing to do as family, but right. they simply took in everybody they could. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's so um, it's such an amazing story. Um, and you know, growing up and knowing this story of your family, can you talk a little about the importance of sharing their experience um, and you know, sharing stories of individuals who are victims of the Holocaust? Um, I know you try and do that through your work um, and your father's work with Violence of Hope. Um, the importance of those, you know, individual stories. Can you just talk about, you know, why it's so important to share these stories? Well, basically, because if we don't learn from our past, we will most probably do the same mistakes as we're done. And uh, as we all know, hatred and uh, racism is not exactly thing of the past anywhere. And uh, we have to talk about it and people have to realize what does it mean when you take it to extremes. Of course, the Holocaust was something which is, uh, let's say, more extreme than probably anyone meant in a way, but uh, it was quite obvious where it's going for a very long time. And nobody came up and said, hey, hey, relax. Let's do a restart and, and start things over again. And this is how things happen. I mean, we see it still in, in many places. Um, I think this would be a good place. I mean, first, I want to say thank you so much um, for being with us here this evening. Um, we really appreciate it coming um, in all the way from Turkey at, is it 2 a.m. now, 2.30 a.m. there? 2.38, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, we really appreciate it. Very dedicated. Um, and I think this would be a great time um, to take any questions that you may have for Avshi about his family story, about the film, about Violence of Hope or um, the Virginia Holocaust Museum. Do you have any questions in the chat? I had someone um, like message me a question okay. directly um, okay. about the, the horse in the film. Was that... Um, Yes. And it did that really happen, or was that supposed to just sort of be like a character building moment uh, uh, for for Daniel Craig as like the leader of this group? No, but they did have a horse. <laughs> okay. We yeah, did not I mean, have I the dramatic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think too, like you know, in a film, um, you see this with like with all historical films, and I'm sure you see this, Maggie, with other films. Yeah. They, you know, there is like this is a very. Um, you know, important, like heroic story, um, you know, but there are some things like within the film that I think are maybe more like dramatized, whereas that poignant moment where they have this montage of where they're all coming together to build, you know, to be a community. And um, as we all know, real life and history is very chaotic, right? It's complex. Um, it's probably not as, um, you know, uh, there probably wasn't a time when he was on on a horse like surveying uh the community um yeah so i mean i think maybe that was a little more more hollywood even though they had they had a horse right i mean watching the film do you obviously i mean what are your thoughts on like you know there is that wedding scene it, it, i mean it was beautiful like it was very poignant of your grandfather and grandmother where they're getting married in the forest and the snow is falling. 
um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on some of the Hollywood um, aspects of the film? Listen, it's Hollywood. Um, <laughs> in the end, uh, I can't complain. You know, they show their version, uh, which is a great thing, I think. Um, and like Edward Zwick said, I mean, if the people will want to learn more, they can always go and read the books. Right. I think it's a great, um, you know, it's like any film or, or movie about history or specifically the Holocaust, you know, it creates this interest in something, right? Yep. And people learn more. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, so we have a question in the chat um, and it says, are you in touch at all with your um, great uncle Aaron? Um, and did you ever talk to him about the film? I understand he's still alive. Yeah, um, Alchik is still alive. Um, actually, I think it was one or two years ago, he was in Russia and uh, we, have, we have a photo of him um, cutting the ribbon with Putin on one of the memorials. Um, I didn't talk to him about the movie. I didn't have a chance, no, but um, listen, everybody liked the movie when it came out because it does and it did expose the story for, for hundreds of millions of people worldwide. People who will never hear, I mean, the story otherwise. Okay, there are books, uh, some of them are translated to, one of them is translated, I think, to seven or eight different languages. But the book is one thing and the Hollywood movie is something else. And when you bring James Bond and Liv Schreiber, I mean, Daniel Craig and Liv Schreiber and, and Jamie Bell, these are, these are known people. It's not someone that uh, you've never seen before. Right. So it, it, it has an impact. There is nothing yeah. to it. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it, it helps to like uh, bring in maybe other people who otherwise wouldn't have known about the story or maybe weren't necessarily like interested in, in learning about history and, and went and saw this and wanted to learn more. So, um, you know, it can only have a positive impact. Um, we have another question and this is about the violins um, of hope. And it says, um, you know, what does it feel like for you um, and your father to like work on those violins? Um, like, I guess, what kind of like emotions do you have about maybe like locating these and um, restoring them um, and, and sharing them with, um, you know, thousands of people? So first of all, of course, my father, uh, for a longer time, we restore all the instruments. It's not uh, that we only make instruments and the only all the instruments that we are touching are the violins from the collection. So the work is the same work. Yeah, but of course, the vast majority of all the instruments, we will never know their history. Uh, for me, I grew up with stories of the Holocaust, knowing my mother's side of the family, knowing their stories. Um, when my father grew up, he grew up in a, in a family which was basically his mother, his father, and his sister. And that was the whole family. And knowing that his father had, he was one of 11 brothers and sisters, which he never knew and never will know any one of them. And my mother, my grandmother, his mother, um, who had seven or eight brothers and sisters, again, not knowing any of them, it's a different thing. I mean, the way he feels is very different from me because he never heard, he never knew, and probably we will never know what happened to his family. And they were basically all lost, about hundreds of members. I mean, nobody knows how many because his parents, my grandparents, they simply, literally never said one word, ever. And we don't know. So for him to work on this is very different than me. Again, third generation, basically, um, growing up with all these stories, growing up in a different era. Uh, my father was born in 1939 in, in Israel. And I mean, it's, it's very different. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in hearing you talk about that, um, thinking about the, you know, we, we say historical wise, the Holocaust ended in 1945, right? But I think the lasting effects or 
you know, the generation until today. Trauma. It's, 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 yeah, I mean, it's the, tra the trauma is until today. You had every single survivor had PTSD. I don't care what they're going to say. Every single survivor, everyone who lived in Europe had PTSD. You're talking about hundreds of millions of people um, who basically never got treated. Yeah, right. let's be honest. I mean, you couldn't, you cannot treat the whole continent. And I don't we, even we, think they knew what that was, right? I mean, today we have a term for it and, you know, we they, have- They probably did know. Um, but there was there was no manpower. There was never right. enough manpower because the, the actual people would give the treatment where they also had the same problem. Right. They also lived through it. Um, so they had to deal with it on their own. Right. I mean, so there are, I mean, they're just generational effects, like lasting effects of the Holocaust. Yes. Like for our local survivors, um, they talk about how they think about it every single day. You know, um, it's something that, you know, never, ever leaves them. So we have a question about the movie and I'm trying to navigate through the chat box. So please be patient with me. These are questions. Um, the question is um, the escape through the wide body of water. Um, the person said it was very dramatic. Was that real? Um, this was real, but this was, uh, um, like I said, the Nazis raided the forest a few times. Uh, they always tried to hunt the partisans um, this specific uh, raid happened. The camp was, I think, seven or eight hundred people um, in number, maybe even more. And because the whole forest was surrender, uh, surrounded, they had nowhere to run. And two local people from the group said that if they run to this and that place, there is a swamp. But in the middle of the swamp, there is an island. So in reality, it took them three days to get uh, through the swamp to the island in the middle of the swamp. At night, they would tie themselves to the woods with ropes or belts so they wouldn't drown. Only one person died during this uh, endeavor. They arrived to the island. They had basically no food. The only thing they carried with them was um, what they could carry with them and as weapon and weapons, of course, which was the, the most uh, precious thing in the forest. They literally ate leaves and roots for two weeks. We could hear the Nazis talking and shouting and shooting, but the Nazis never went into the swamp. And this is how they survived. And later, after two weeks, they left the swamp, moved to a bigger forest and uh, survived. And then there were other raids. So this raid happened. It didn't end like you see it ended. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons my uncle uh, Archie uh, Aon is still alive is that during one of those raids, the, um, he had a medical problem. He couldn't run. And my, grandfather, my grandmother, she stopped someone um, asking him, said, can you please help me carry him? him? And he said, no. Um, and she took out her gun, her pistol, put it to his head and said, well, if you're not going to help me, I'm going to kill you right here and now. And he had to carry Aaron um, together with all the group. And this is how Aaron was saved. The follow up to that question um, was about bombings. Um, did that really happen? And how often did that occur? Do you know? There were raids, there were no bombings. I mean, the Nazis did try to locate them from the air, uh, of course, with collaborators. Um, as far as I know, there were no direct bombing with, with planes because the camp was, they knew about the raid, they ran away um, before there were no line of defense and then whatever. I mean, everybody simply, they took themselves and they started going as a group. Um, so it wasn't like, again, listen, it's Hollywood. It has to be dramatic. It has to be nice and looking good. But uh, these, the raids happened not exactly this way. 
So um, we have some questions about the Violins of Hope. Um, one of them is, and I know you get asked this question a lot, and I think I've actually asked this to you, and I'm sure other people have as well. Um, and maybe you have a different answer for us this time. Um, what is your favorite um, Violin of Hope story? So um, I don't have a different answer. I'll give you the answer that I'm always giving. And um, I think that my role, um, and also in a way, also my father's role um, in it, is to bring those instruments to life and bring their stories. And I don't think I should be, and I don't want to be in a position saying that someone's story is more important than someone else's. I think they're all important. I think that from every single story we can learn. Um, if someone wants to find, says, you know, I prefer this, I prefer that, it's okay with me. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a favorite. I think that for us as the restorers and those who bring those stories and instruments to life, it's wrong to choose. Um, I think every one of them represents life which survived or life which were taken and I, I really honestly I cannot say which what someone's life is more important than someone else's life I, I I mean this is in my again in my opinion it's wrong so um where can uh, find these violins so these display um, that was a question. Um, these are on display until October 24th um, at the Virginia Holocaust Museum, at the Virginia um, Black History Museum and Cultural Center, um, and at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture as well. Um, so we invite you to come see these violins in person, to hear about their stories. Um, Museum of History and Culture actually has um, um, Bielski violin on display there. Um, and uh, Afshi, do you wanna share just like briefly about violin, um, the history behind it? Um, so yeah, this is, uh, you can see this is a Klezmer violin. Um, the Klezmer violins, we don't really have stories. Uh, we don't know their history. Um, so what uh, my father decided is he's dedicating them to different stories. So this is a volume which is dedicated to the story of the Bielski partisans. Um, and this is the connection. This is the volume that you see here in front of you. Um, and I mean, this is, again, it's in a way to try and bring different type of stories to life. And uh, this is the way my father chose to do it, which I think is right because the vast majority of the instruments which were played in ghettos camps or individuals, we will never, no chance. But uh, this is a way to try and keep some stories, some stories in people's mind. Right. And if, so if you wanna learn more about, you know, where the violins are, um, any upcoming programming um, or concerts, um, please visit Violins of Hope um, Richmond. Um, you can Google it. Um, you can go directly to the, um, the website address. Um, Avshi, where can we find you? So when these violins leave, um, how do people find you and what you're up to? Um, we have kind of a website I did it, so it's not a great website. It's uh, violin minus, violins minus hope, minus hope .com. Um, You can see the other events which we have. We are basically scheduled now until 2024 with almost no break, if COVID allows us. Um, we are going, next place we're going to is Reading, Pennsylvania, and then Los Angeles. In January, we start a big project in New York. After that, South Carolina, then Indianapolis. Portland, Maine, um, probably Panama, then New Orleans, uh, East Bay, San Francisco, um, then Argentina, Chicago, 
Oh my goodness. Uh, I mean, it's, and the list goes on. <laughs> so you're going to be everywhere. Are you on? Hopefully, yeah. Uh, is Violins of Hope on like Twitter or Instagram or Facebook? Are we able to find? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to. <laughs> All I don't right, have so enough we will, time. We will check out the website for more information. And, and there is one more answer here. Uh, question, okay. Sorry. Um, someone asked that uh, he saw that my grandfather was actually second in command. Not oh, Zeus, okay. That he was older. Yeah, that's true. When my grandfather was the, actually the first one to go into the forest and later on, uh, he was joined by Zeus and the Tuvia. And in the beginning, he was voted to be the... Um, the camp leader, but he said because uh, Tuvia, his brother, was older, that uh, Tuvia should be the leader and he will be second in command. So yes, he was older than Zeus, um, but um, and he was the second in command. But again, this was a family thing. You know, this was this was the way things were done then. But yeah, he was older and uh, he was second in command in the camp. Then later on, like. I said he had to leave, with, I think, two or 300 people from the fighting unit, including Zeus, to the Russian uh, partisans. And later on, he simply deserted and went back to the original group. Well, wow. thank you so much, Avshi, um, for this evening. Thank you for sharing the family story with us. Um, again, I mean, it's just... Um, like so inspiring and such a powerful story um, to be shared with people. Um, so I wanna thank you for doing that. I want to thank you for your work with Violins of Hope. And again, if you would like to hear um, and see the Violins of Hope, they are on display until um, October 24th. So we hope to come and see them in person before they leave the Richmond area. Um, so thank you so much again for everyone who is joining us this evening as well. Thank you very much. Questions. And thank you, Avshi. And Megan. <laughs> thank you. <everyone. laughs> thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.